Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Scott Appleby. I am the Dean of the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. And I'm delighted to join my colleagues in the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and the Keough Nocton Institute for Irish Studies in welcoming you to this discussion of two of the world's most successful and promising peace accords. To specify that these are the accords negotiated and designed to advance the respective peace processes in Northern Ireland and Colombia tells us something about what success looks like in the real world of violent internecine conflict and also which virtues are required to achieve success in this arena. Among them, stamina, persistence, and an ample supply of hope. There is no one better to lead us in this comparative analysis of the conditions necessary for sustainable peace than our featured keynote speaker, Eamon Gilmore. Mr. Gilmore is the European Union Special Representative for Human Rights, a post he has held since February 2019. Since 2015, he has also served as the EU Special Envoy for the Colombian peace process. The Deputy Head of Government and Foreign Minister of the Republic of Ireland from 2011 to 2014, Mr. Gilmore was a member of the Irish, the Irish Assembly Doyle Aran, the lower house of the Irish legislature for more than 25 years. This experience and that quality of persistence enabled him to, to become an influential supporter of the Good Friday Agreement of April 1998. He continues to work for reconciliation, peace, and human rights in that region and around the world, notably in Colombia, where he has played an important role in mobilizing international support for the implementation of the Colombian Peace Accords. Peace Accord. It is a particular privilege to welcome again Special Representative Gilmore, who was the keynote speaker for the very first public event of the Keough School of Global Affairs Washington DC office. The event was entitled Strategies for Lasting Peace Accords. In June, June 2018, we held it. We were honored at that point to co-sponsor the event with the Irish Embassy to the United States. Following Mr. Gilmore's remarks, my colleague David Courtright, who is the director of the Keough School's Global Policy Initiative and former director of the Peace Accords Matrix, will introduce our respondents and moderate the discussion. Mr. Gilmore, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Dean Scott Appleby, for that uh, introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, to everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you uh, and to be back, albeit virtually, at the uh, University of Notre Dame. Uh, as you said, uh, Dean uh, Appleby, I had the honour of addressing the Kyo School's Washington inauguration in 2018, and I'm very pleased uh, to see how the school has gone from strength to strength since then. Uh, including through the Global Policy Initiative. Of course, I'm very familiar with the excellent work of the Kroc Institute and have had regular contact uh, with the team uh, through my work as the Special Envoy for the Peace Process in Colombia. Indeed, only yesterday, uh, I had a briefing from uh, jo Josefina and uh, her colleagues uh, on the <clears throat> latest report uh, which the Kroc Institute is presenting. Your contribution to the implementation of the peace process in monitoring and tracking the 310 pages of commitments in the final peace agreement between Colombia and FARC has been invaluable. It has helped us all to better understand what has been achieved and what still needs to be done. I have had the privilege to be involved in two peace processes. In my own country of Ireland as Ponishja or Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, I had responsibility for managing the implementation of the Northern Ireland peace agreement known as the Good Friday Agreement. And I have been the EU Special Envoy for the peace process in Colombia since 2015. My role as Special Envoy was to support the implementation of the peace agreement. However, due to the delays in concluding the agreement, I also supported the negotiations in Havana and met with the parties in Cuba several times. 
Prior to the pandemic, I visited Colombia regularly to bolster EU political support for the peace implementation and to meet with victims, human rights defenders, government opposition, FARC, civil society and media. While I am now the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, I also continue my work as Special Envoy and continue to meet with Colombian interlocutors. The first thing that I would say about both the Colombian and Northern Ireland peace processes is that they are both a success, albeit with problems. There are many challenges, as there are in the implementation of any peace agreement, but there are many achievements and countless lives have been saved because of these agreements. As with every conflict, those of Northern Ireland and Colombia are different in scale, causes and context. The Colombia con conflict lasted 53 years and resulted in 9 million victims, including over 240,000 killed, 100,000 disappeared and 7.7 .7 million people displaced. It was largely concerned with issues regarding political participation, inequality and resources, especially land access and ownership. The main actor, FARC, had developed a sophisticated military structure with camps and training grounds linked often to the drugs trade and supply lines and mainly operated in rural areas. The Northern Ireland conflict was very different. It spanned 30 years with more than 3,500 killed. At its heart were issues of national identity, overlaying with religious affiliation, the constitutional status of Northern Ireland and civil rights. The main actors involved uh, operated mainly in small cell-based paramilitary structures and their activities were largely concentrated in urban areas. Both peace processes built on several previous attempts at peace negotiations, which had not succeeded, and both sets of negotiations followed the principle that nothing was agreed until everything was agreed. There are a number of elements which I believe were conducive to bringing both processes to a successful conclusion. Firstly, both drew on lessons learned from other contexts, and Colombia in particular looked to Northern Ireland. During the, those negotiations, politicians, trade unionists and human rights activists traveled between Northern Ireland, Bogota and Havana to assist in the peace talks. Indeed, this was influenced by President Santos's own experience. In 1974, he was walking past the Naval and Military Club in Piccadilly in London when a bomb exploded in a nearby bin. It threw him to the ground and he was un unharmed. The blast had been planted by the IRA. This stayed with Santos and when the time came to negotiate with FARC, he drew inspiration from Northern Ireland. And of course, FARC themselves also had their own ties with Ireland. Secondly, dialogue was the central feature of both processes. In the case of Colombia, the dialogue was in the form of direct talks between the parties, which were divided into six chapters, which covered the main causes of the conflict. In Northern Ireland, a mediator, former US Senator George Mitchell, was appointed to steer the talks, which covered three strands, relationships within Northern Ireland, relations within the island of Ireland, North and South, and relations between Ireland and the UK. Thirdly, in both processes, the negotiators recognized the need for the agreement to be comprehensive and to address the root causes of the conflicts. Otherwise, the potential for new cycles of violence and breakdowns in the peace process would never be far away. Agreements should be implemented in their entirety to have the greatest chance of success as the elements are interlinked and interdependent. We see that clearly with the Colombian agreement, which is very detailed, particularly in relation to the causes of the conflict. It is much more ambitious than the Good Friday Agreement in that regard. The Good Friday Agreement was deliberately broad, but it ended the conflict and it led to further negotiations to resolve remaining issues. Indeed, the broad nature of the Good Friday Agreement and the need for successive agreements is often used politically in Colombia to argue for the reopening of the agreement with FARC and to the making of changes to it. The fourth point that I would make is that international solidarity and support are crucial to any peace process. The world needs good news and more stability and peace 
makes the world safer for all of us. The support of international actors, including the United States, Canada, the European Union, as well as the Irish diaspora, proved critical in the run-up to and also following the Good Friday Agreement and remains hugely important to this day. In, Col in Colombia, the governments of Norway and Cuba act as guarantors of the final agreement and played a critical role in the negotiations. The United Nations oversaw the demobilization, disarmament and reincorporation process through a tripartite mechanism with the government and FARC, and it still monitors the party's compliance with the final agreement through the UN verification mission under the guidance of UN Special Representative Carlos Ruiz. The consistent attention of the UN Security Council has also played a very valuable role in sustaining the Colombian peace process. International support can also provide credibility and space for further confidence building in implementation. International support is even more important after a deal is reached as implementation is often the hardest part. In that context, the fifth element in, is the involvement of the European Union itself. The European Union brings considerable credibility to peace negotiations. The EU is itself a peace project and stability in Europe has clearly illustrated that no country or region operates in a vacuum. In the case of Northern Ireland, the EU membership of both Ireland and the UK provided the space for discussion and dialogue and was the working assumption on which the agreement was based. Between 1995 and 2020, there were four EU peace programmes in Northern Ireland with a financial contribution of 1.6 billion euros. And despite Brexit, the EU has committed to fund projects up until 2027 with a total value of 1 billion euros. In Colombia, the EU has been supporting peace for over two decades. This, this has covered a broad range of actions, but particularly support to peace building from the ground up with civil societies and local communities through the Peace Laboratories project and its successor programs. This is why uh, the peace agreement, uh, this is why when the peace agreement was reached in Colombia, the European Union was named as a supporting actor in three areas, rural development, reincorporation of former far combatants into civilian life, and the establishment of a special investigation unit to support the prosecutor general's office. To affect that, we established an EU trust fund with 127 million euros in 2016 to support implementation of the agreement. The sixth point I would make is that civil society involvement is imperative and civil society uh, continues to play an enormously important role in both processes. Inclusivity gives legitimacy and stability, but it requires time and effort and not just from political parties or guerrilla groups. In the Colombian negotiations, victims, women, civil society, and indigenous and Afro-Colombian people all contributed to the discussions at different stages. As a result, there are specific provisions in that agreement as a, uh, as a result on gender and ethnicity that recognize the specific effects of the conflict on these populations. I am deeply concerned by the killings of social leaders, human rights defenders, and ex-combatants since the Colombian Agreement was signed. Practical solutions to such a complex situation can only be found by sustained dialogue with civil society and local communities, and the National Commission for Security Guarantees can be an important vehicle for that dialogue. Every peace process needs women to be centrally involved. The participation of women strengthens the process and enhances the outcome. In Northern Ireland, the formation and participation of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition was critical to an atmosphere of openness and problem solving, which enabled the parties to overcome difficult and politically contentious issues. And I would also say that the role played by the late Mo Mola, whom Tony Blair had appointed as the first woman to be Secretary of State for Northern Ireland was critical in that process. Any agreement requires compromises from both sides, and those compromises are often most difficult when it comes to transitional justice. Colombia went for a very innovative transitional justice system, which is victim-centered, 
providing for prosecution and sanctioning through restriction of liberty for several years rather than imprisonment. Three institutions make up the integral system of truth, justice, reparation, and non-repetition. The special jurisdiction for peace known as the HEP, the Truth Commission, and the search unit for the disappeared. This year will be a significant year for the integral system. And just in the past week, FARC have responded to the contents of Auto 019 from the HEP, fully recognizing their collective role in kidnapping during the conflict. This is a very important step forward for victims and for truth and reconciliation. The commitment of the parties is absolutely vital to the peace process. President Duque and his administration has consistently reiterated to me his commitment to the implementation of the peace agreement. So too has the FARC leadership. And I understand that they are working with the UN to use the tripartite mechanism to resolve outstanding issues, such as the delivery of assets. We have seen good progress in the reincorporation uh, process and on the PADETS process or in rural development. And we know that there is considerable work being done in the regions and the European Union is supporting these efforts and will continue to do so. Lastly, I believe that confidence building measures have a positive impact on negotiations. This is why the EU supported humanitarian demining, including a demining pilot project between FARC and the armed forces before the agreement was signed. Other confidence building measures include back channels, and these were used over many years in both the Northern Ireland process and in Colombia to create the conditions for the beginning of formal negotiations. Back channels could, I believe, continue to be used to encourage the restarting of talks in Colombia with the ELN. Today, both Colombia and Northern Ireland are undergoing significant challenges. Just this past month, we marked the 23rd anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement and the centenary of the foundation of Northern Ireland and the partition of Ireland. This is against the background of a struggling power sharing executive, which has only been restored for a few short months after three years in abeyance. Brexit created further divisions and has led to a simmering tension. The Northern Ireland Protocol in the EU-UK Withdrawal Agreement was designed to protect the Good Friday Agreement by avoiding a hard economic border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. It means that Northern Ireland remains in the EU single market for goods, so products being moved from Great Britain to Northern Ireland undergo EU import procedures. This avoids the need for checks on the Irish border as EU customs rules are enforced at Northern Ireland's ports instead. Anger has grown since the terms of the Brexit deal took effect at the start of this year and has uh, exploded into violence uh, during the week of the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Rioting broke out on the streets of several towns and cities in Northern Ireland. Loyalist paramilitaries have withdrawn their support for the Good Friday Agreement and dissident Republican groups, such as the new IRA, have also moved to renew their campaign aimed at intimidating the police force. Aside from the fallout from Brexit, there are still structural issues that need to be addressed in Northern Ireland to consolidate peace building. For example, fewer than 10% of pupils in Northern Ireland attend religiously integrated schools. Social interaction between the two main religious communities remains limited. Dozens of so-called peace walls continue to divide Protestant and Catholic neighborhoods. This week, Colombia too has witnessed considerable unrest and violence in protests that originated in the now withdrawn tax reform bill. I'm profoundly shocked by these events, and I want to express my sincere condolences to the families and friends of the people who have been killed and the hundreds who have been injured. While the events of the past week were not specifically about peace or the peace process, they clearly point to mistrust, anger and frustration, which need to be resolved with dialogue. The complexity of the challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic demand peaceful efforts by all political actors and sectors of society to reduce tensions, to promote inclusive dialogue that provide effective responses to the aspirations of the Colombian people and to forge consensus around the country's major challenges. There must be trust between the population and those who protect it. This is often a barometer for democracy. To ensure that trust, any excessive use of force must be thoroughly investigated 
and the perpetrator is brought to justice. The right to peaceful protest is fundamental in any healthy democracy, but indignation and outrage, while understandable, should never be accompanied by violence. As the great John Lewis once said, fury spends itself pretty quickly when there's no fury facing it. One thing that is clear from both the Northern Ireland and Colombian peace processes is the necessity for equality to nurture and sustain peace. You cannot have a peaceful future where you have a large section of the population who are left behind and who know it. Groups that are distrusted and discriminated against or those who do not feel that they have an equal voice in their own society can sometimes be led to violence. It does not take a majority to destroy peace. Sometimes it is only a small group. As one of Ireland's famous journalists, Tommy Gorman, who has recently retired and who covered Northern Ireland for many years recently said, we need to be careful that we do not create a generation or a group of politically homeless people. In a recent opinion poll, people in nor North and South of Ireland were asked about the possibility of a border poll on the unification of North and South. The Good Friday Agreement settles that a 50% plus one majority is all that would be required in a border poll. However, despite increasing discussion due to Brexit, it is clear that there is considerable caution on both sides. The findings show that most people North and South would prefer a two thirds or even a 70% majority threshold for a border poll. Of course, this is just one opinion poll, but it illustrates the complexities involved and that people fear a return to violence. I hope, I would hope that it shows also that North and, uh, North and South, that we have developed a much more mature accommodation and an understanding of the other. Seamus Heaney, captured the desolation of the troubles with the following words. The dream of justice became subsumed into the callousness of reality and people settled into a quarter century of life waste and spirit waste, of hardening attitudes and narrowing possibilities that were the natural result of political solidarity, traumatic suffering and sheer emotional self-protectiveness. We cannot go back to that life waste and spirit waste. These peace agreements in Colombia and Northern Ireland were reached through the realization that the other is not an aberration or an enemy. In a social media driven age, it is easy to retreat into talking only to people who share the same political outlook and never to challenge our assumptions. The politics is a contest of ideas. In any healthy debate, different sides will prioritize different goals and different means of reaching. Without some willingness to listen, we will continue to talk past each other, making common ground impossible. Above all, there must be respect, especially for those with whom we disagree. At its core, peace is about protecting human rights. Conflict often comes from the denial of human rights. This too is a lesson from both the Colombian and Northern Ireland peace processes. Much of my work these days that I do as uh, the Special Representative for Human Rights relates directly to conflict and peace building. Yesterday, I met with three courageous representatives from civil society in Yemen. Earlier today, Human Rights Watch briefed me on their latest report on the situation in Israel and Palestine. And over the last week, I was dealing with continuing violence in Tigray, the Sahel, Myanmar, and the human rights situation in Ukraine. In all of this work, I draw on my own experience and knowledge of the peace processes in Northern Ireland and Colombia. There is much to be learned from both, but probably the most important lesson is that the work of building and sustaining peace is never finished. And we must always be vigilant that just when we think we have ended a conflict, it bubbles up again in another place and sometimes in a different form. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Gilmore, for these incisive 
challenging, uh, very important observations uh, for us. So uh, to continue the program now, we uh, want to hear comments and responses uh, to Mr. Gilmore from our distinguished panel. Uh, I'll introduce the, the four respondents uh, first, and then uh, they will speak in order. And, and then after their comments, we'll have a general discussion uh, among all of the presenters and, and begin to uh, address some of the questions that have come in from those of you who are listening. Um, our panel will begin with uh, Professor Josefina Echeverria Alvarez. She's uh, Associate Professor of the Practice at the, Kios, at the Kroc Institute and the Keogh School of Global Affairs, and is the Director of the Peace Accords Matrix and of the Barometer Program in Colombia. She previously was a Senior Lecturer at the Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Innsbruck, and has published and worked widely on peace building, peace education, gender, and other issues. Also in the panel will be Patrick Griffin, the Madden Hennebury Professor of History uh, at the Keogh School and Director of the Keogh Naughton Institute for Irish Studies, an accomplished historian of the intersection among Irish, British, and US history. Uh, following Patrick will be Laurie Nathan, Professor of the Practice and Director of the Mediation Program at the Kroc Institute former senior advisor to the UN mediation program and mediation and peacemaking efforts in uh, various parts of Africa and the former director of the Center for Conflict Research at the University of Cape Town. And also Professor Itan Tanam, Associate Professor of International Peace Studies at Trinity College, Dublin, an expert on Irish and Northern Ireland border issues and British-Irish political relations with a special focus on the impact of Brexit. We'll begin with you, uh, Josefina, please. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, Eamon, for those wonderful words. I think that when I, when we thought about doing comments after your speech, I don't know what we were thinking, but I think that you've said uh, everything so eloquently and in such a powerful way. I will not try to comment on what you just said. I would just try to comment on the situation that we are facing, especially in Colombia. So for those of you who are uh, now listening or tuned in to, into our event, you might know that uh, at the Croc Institute, we have a very special role in Colombia since 2016. So of course, our peace building work, especially through a Catholic uh, peace building network had started before many years ago. But in 2016, we were honored to receive the mandate within the sixth chapter of the peace agreement to um, create a special methodology to monitor the implementation of the, of the 2016 comprehensive peace agreement. And most importantly, not only um, have a system of information about what was going on on the ground, but also to be able to identify obstacles and suggest opportunities for making implementation more robust. So echoing what Eamon was saying before, we know that precisely bringing together peace research, uh, policy and the practice of peace building is, is absolutely essential to listen to not only what the scholars have to say, but also to listen what people have to say in the territories. How are they dealing with the different uh, programs and plans? How are they actually turning the text of the peace agreement into a living reality? And that we all can share and learn from that. Well, we know now, uh, this is our fourth year of implementation in Colombia, is that uh, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement had at its main, as its main objective to not only stop the violence, not only stop the, let's say, the systematic organization of, of violence in the form of war between the farc -EP and the Colombian government, but it also asks how can we prevent this violence to be seen again uh, on the surface of our everyday politics. And this is why we have in Colombia the most comprehensive peace agreement that has ever been agreed upon since the end of the Cold War, 
which is an agreement that speaks about demobilization and uh, leaving the weapons on the side for illegal armed groups, but it also speaks about the reforms that are necessary so that we are able to tackle the structural causes of violence. Some of the most salient aspects of these reforms uh, were mentioned by, by um, Special Representative Gilmore some minutes ago. We're talking about transitional justice, but also a very important aspect of the 2016 peace agreement is, of course, everything that has to do with political participation all that second big chapter of the agreement that has a series of stipulations or a series of commitments that uh, are very relevant at this precise uh, moment in time when we see uh, with a lot of sorrow and worry uh, what, is, what is happening on the streets in Colombia since the 28th of April. And those are especially the guarantees for a uh, social and peaceful protest, as well as the guarantees for reconciliation. So we have, especially with these stipulations, two different ways of tackling the violence that we are seeing on the streets in a very structural way. That is not just to, let's say, pacify, but is also to transform. Um, while we're able to recognize that peace agreements are platforms. They are platforms that should give us the tools and provide the spaces so that we're able to transform social, political, economic, even environmental conflicts in peaceful ways. So what we're trying to do is not to overcome conflict. What we're trying to do is to overcome violence. Violence is, uh, we say in, in, in peace studies, Violence is, uh, let's say, when we have failed to be able to transform conflicts peacefully. So what we're trying to do is to think, how can we implement the peace agreement, especially making emphasis on this chapter two, knowing that political participation, knowing that the guarantees for peaceful social protest are also going to have a direct effect on other chapters of the agreement, especially the chapter, of course, on demobilization and reincorporation. Our hope is that we take uh, this moment, this crisis, and see it as an opportunity to make a much more robust implementation of the peace agreement, knowing that it's not only tackling the violence on the streets, but the root causes, and if you want, that web of relationality that continues creating these episodes of violence. We think that unless we don't tackle that which is beyond the surface of the violence, we're not going to be able to transform violence in a much more sustainable way. And finally, I think that with the example of um, the peace walls in Northern Ireland, I think that uh, what we heard some minutes ago is, is quite important for us in Colombia. And is that to think in the in the midterm and in the long term of what it implies to really create reconciliation among us. It is, of course, not just to speak about non-stigmatization, but Adam Curl said it many years ago, uh, is to realize that the boundaries between us are hallucinations, that we are all members of the same community. So I hope that when we're able to see that line that connects us all, it would also deter us uh, from the use of violence that we are uh, sadly witnessing in the last days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, over to you. Yeah, thanks, David. And Josefina, thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, Eamon Gilmore has called the Good Friday Agreement a success albeit with problems, and it has saved countless lives. And indeed, in both of these, on both of these issues, he is exactly right. And I'm honored to be here with him, and I applaud him for the work that he has done to make this a success, to help us, as he puts it, see a world beyond, uh, beyond life waste and spirit waste. Today, it seems that these successes, as he pointed out, are challenged. I'd like to characterize some of the challenges today and offer a provocation. An historian's provocation to help us understand it. 
Now it's easy for us to focus on the problems or the challenges of Good Friday as, as Eamon has. Um, its implementation, of, we know, has been problematic. It seems ever fragile. It budges issues that people sometimes would rather confront. But I would like to suggest that these have been the strengths of the agreement and these strengths are now imperiled. How strength? The Good Friday or Belfast Agreement's strength is even implicit in its name. Whether we call it Good Friday or Belfast is in the eye of the beholder. The name you use tells us a good deal about your perspective on things. The name itself is a marker. Uh, Eamon, of course, referred to it as Good Friday, but I imagine his confreres in Britain would call it the, the Belfast Agreement. Unionists tend to call it the Belfast Agreement. Nationalists tend to call it the Good Friday Agreement. But we can all live, sometimes begrudgingly, with either name. The way that we think about the agreement in general is the way maybe we think about one of the principal cities in Northern Ireland, Derry or Londonderry. Is it Derry or Londonderry? Well, it's in the eye of the beholder. Indeed, so much so that we call it Derry slash Londonderry or Derry stroke Londonderry, the stroke city. The name bespeaks ambiguity and ambivalence. And this is what Good Friday stroke Belfast was based on. It allows each group people all too often trapped in the tired binaries of unionists and nationalists that Northern Ireland is known for to construct alternative realities. Does it make a future for unification possible? Does it cement the union? The answer is yes and no, not yes or no. It allows people to construe things as they will. We could indeed call the, Bel the Good Friday Belfast Agreement the Stroke Agreement. And this has been a great benefit because it makes for multiple aspirations. It allows people to move beyond the tired binaries. More importantly, it does not occasion questions that lead to confronting the past. The past, of course, does not only haunt here in Northern Ireland, it lives and breathes. It has a life of its own. Ambiguity leaves the past buried. So even though the stroke agreement has not been fully implemented, even though Northern Ireland seems to limp along, sometimes not so gracefully, even if it seems to be dysfunctional, it has not been violent. Violence too takes its energy from the past. Creative ambiguity blunts that energy. Now, well, Brexit is a different creature. Brexit eschews ambiguity. It asks actors for clarity. What will sovereignty look like? What does the border mean? How should it be drawn? How should the North situate itself vis-a-vis -vis Britain and Europe? These are deadly questions. Alas, sometimes literally. They make people confront. They make people revisit the past to the exclusions, to the bloodshed, to the vexed questions that cannot in actuality be answered. History provides too many painful episodes for all involved. History established and still establishes powerful myths that sustain conceits of power and of grievance. And it ensnares quest people in questions of who they are and what they hope to be. The stroke agreement peddles in amnesia. And each day that past lay buried beneath ambiguity, the whole island, the whole island grows stronger. Now, this is a funny thing for an historian to say. But the times when we are fixated on the past and how to order it in order to make sense of our plight today and of our aspirations for tomorrow, we are onto contentious territory because clarity sometimes can weaponize. Now we at Notre Dame have been trying to facilitate a discussion on the future of Ireland without, without resorting to this vexed past and without pressing for sometimes unhelpful clarity. Along with the Royal Irish Academy, we've created what we call the Aaron's Project analyzing and researching Ireland North and South. We hope to become a venue for all sorts of people to discuss not the past, but the present and the future of the island. The Aaron's Project offers, as we put it, authoritative, independent, and nonpartisan analysis and research on constitutional, institutional, and policy options for Ireland North and South in a post-Brexit context. It brings together experts to provide evidence-based research and analysis on the most significant questions in policy and public debate facing the island of Ireland, North and South. The key is facing. We're trying to situate ourselves as much as we can in the present. 
The project will facilitate and disseminate research on the challenges and opportunities presented to the island in a post-Brexit context with the intention of contributing to an informed public discourse. Now, some of the issues inevitably we'll be discussing are constitutional and they're bound to identity, but we hope to engage them across the broad spectrum. And we hope to do so without all the cultural baggage of the past impeding us as we do so. We offer nothing prescriptive at all. Our aim is to facilitate. But we also want to cover other issues that are beyond sometimes these touchy sorts of things. Issues that really matter to people on a day-to-day -day basis, such as how do you kind of measure cross-border differences in living standards? How do you kind of look at cross-border cooperation and health? What about the Northern Ireland subvention? How do you foster interdependency between North and South? Transportation, logistics, education, gender equality, welfare benefits. We're looking at all of these issues and so many more. Now, these are vital questions and they are bound to where people in Ireland, North and South find themselves now. To sum it up, Ireland is being pressed for clarity. We're pressing for understanding, but one that's not wedded to the vexed notions of the past, that's open to ambiguity and that welcomes all comers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Laurie, please. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gilmore and Dean Appleby for, and all the panelists. I think we, we can safely assume that any peace agreement is likely to experience challenges and that is never likely to be a complete success. As we know, peace agreements sometimes break down completely, but even if they don't, as we've seen in Northern Ireland and Colombia and my own country, South Africa, they experience challenges in the form of conflict and sometimes of violent conflict. There are many reasons for this. One of them is that peace agreements generate winners and losers. You know, we like to say in a kind of romantic way that peace processes should lead to win-win outcomes. But in reality, we are addressing the problem of inequality of power through peace agreements. And whether objectively or as a matter of perception, the peace agreements end up with some groups benefiting and other groups benefiting less or even losing. A second reason for challenges down the road is, has to do with reconciliation. A peace process may be able to forge reconciliation among the leadership of political parties, but that doesn't include political groups that stayed outside the peace process for whatever reason, nor does it necessarily trickle down to the members of political parties and to communities. So there's the outstanding challenge of national or social reconciliation. A third problem is that, as Mr. Gilmore said, these peace agreements entail compromises necessarily. So negotiated settlements require compromises. Those compromises may be sound and necessary, but down the line, as time progresses, they may be the seeds of renewed conflict. Um, a fourth problem is that even though peace agreements, as Mr. Gilmore said, need to attend to root causes of conflict in order to prevent a recurrence of violence, the agreement may not do so adequately. And it may not do so, it might not do so comprehensively. So what's the conclusion? I think the conclusion is that we, we need to be thinking more seriously about the post-peace agreement institutionalization of conflict management and conflict resolution institutions. In other words, we should be working on the assumption there will be conflict down the line. And that the institutions of governance, police, judiciary, parliament, etc., will all play some kind of conflict management function. But the challenge, I think, is whether we need, in addition, some kind of national peace architecture. We do have some precedents. Um, Ghana has a National Peace Council, there was a National Peace Committee in Nigeria, uh, in Togo, and in South Africa's transition to democracy, we had national peace architectures. The South African national peace architecture was very successful, uh, not completely, but very successful, and it had four features in particular that are worth thinking about. The first is that the national peace architecture existed at national, provincial, and local levels. 
So it covered the country at different levels of scale and the local committees had some relative autonomy. Second, the functions of these committees included conflict prevention, conflict management, and conflict resolution. The committees were themselves forums for mediation, and at local level, the committees deployed mediators who had been trained where they were needed. Third, these committees focused on both structural problems and on the behavior of political parties and security forces. So there was a focus both on conduct, actions, and also on structural issues. And fourth and perhaps most important, the composition of these committees included government, political parties, civil society, and police. So they were multi-stakeholder forms. There hasn't been enough comparative research to indicate exactly where such committees are most likely or least likely to be effective and what their challenges are. And there's certainly no formula or kind of recipe uh, for a national peace architecture in any country to look like that in any other country. So its design would be context specific and would have to be designed by local and national actors. But I think it's a challenge both to societies that have ongoing tension around peace agreements and a challenge to agencies, the UN and the EU that support them, challenge also to peace researchers would be, what can we learn from the experience of other countries regarding these peace architectures in a way that may be helpful for replication elsewhere? Great, thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, Etan, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Keogh, Keogh Institute and the Kroc Institute for inviting me um, and to Dean Appleby. And also it's really a privilege for me to be uh, to hear Special Representative Gilmore because I missed an event in Trinity before everything was by Zoom, which wasn't recorded and, and didn't hear him. So it's, it's lovely and very useful for me to have heard him. I um, have found each presentation intriguing and it stimulated too many thoughts. So I'm going to emphasize a few themes which have come to mind as well as some thoughts which I have been preparing for this event. And I suppose starting off actually um, with Patrick um, in terms of the creative ambiguity, which some people call the Good Friday Agreement, which has been so beneficial and also, most of all, what Special Representative Gilmore has emphasized that the Good Friday Agreement, Stroke Belfast Agreement, or Stroke Agreement, as Patrick has called it, has been a huge success. That for all the negative issues now and the conflicts and tensions since Brexit, we do know, as the Special Representative said, that so many lives have been saved because of it. And I think it's to thank and commend those involved, um, including um, the special rep representative um, for that achievement. However, we know that there have been and are significant problems. And as again, as Patrick said, Brexit removed that sort of ambiguity, that wish to leave the past behind, to be British and Irish and European, and to park the issue of unification and the border. It really put a huge dent, to say the least, in that way of thinking. And it returned many people to the concept of sovereignty as an absolute concept that was zero sum. And that is where its greatest negative impact has been thematically. In turn, that has damaged many issues which have come up in this discussion. It has damaged issues around perceptions of equality, which I agree with Laurie are so central, and again with Special Representative Gilmore. It has damaged perceptions of, well, fairness, of course, and trust between the governments and between communities in Northern Ireland and between unionists and the Irish government. At every level, it has had a hugely negative impact on trust. All these issues, which we have seen from the talk so far, are central to a peace process and to reconciliation, which Josephina has emphasized as really being the fundamental effect of a peace process that we wish to see, and that is necessary to make peace feel and be secure over the long term. So these are things which have really 
arisen because of Brexit, which are very much at the forefront. We've seen the riots in Northern Ireland. Today, we saw the surprise announcement of the British government of a decision, allegedly, to set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which goes against previous agreements between the British and Irish governments on legacy issues in Northern Ireland about how to deal with victims of the past and with perpetrators um, of, of killings. That has occurred without consultation with the Irish government, which is a very big change um, from how relations have been. So that relationship, that trust has been affected very deeply as well. Moving from that, so they are the problems. Um, and moving from that about how to fix it and what to do. When the special representative uh, Gilmore was speaking about the lead up to the Good Friday Agreement and the negotiations, I was struck by the role of external actors, uh, the role of the European Union, also the United States, um, which all helped oil the wheels and facilitate agreement. And I was also struck by the emphasis on multi-party dialogue and the level of trust that was needed to get to that stage before the agreement was actually signed. So I would emphasize that there were long-term processes as well before the 90s that contributed to the Good Friday Agreement. And as Brendan O'Leary has written about and talked about um, from University um, of Philadelphia, who was my PhD supervisor, so I must disclose that influence, the long-term influences began in the 1980s and they emphasized very strongly the three strands approach, which Special Representative Gilmore mentioned, the relations within Northern Ireland, relations between Northern Ireland and Ireland cross-border and relations between the British and Irish governments, which were central, a central bedrock, which for John Hume were, was really essential to build the other relations. It was really the bedrock that relations between the governments had been so poor and that they should be the guarantors of peace and of whatever agreement was reached and protect their communities. Um, so unionists would look to the British government and nationalists would look to the Irish government, thereby, as uh, former diplomat Rory Montgomery has said, providing a balance. Both communities would feel protected, both would feel equality and parity was protected. My key argument is that in looking at institutions, as Laurie very in, um, really stimulated me, talked about the institution um, proposal for South Africa, the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement have not been used robustly. They have not been implemented as they were intended. Sadly, John Hume became ill uh, very quickly after the Good Friday Agreement, so we did not have his wisdom uh, to help. But also because of peace, there was neglect of strands two and three, relations on the island, cross-border relations that were meant to flourish, and also strand three relations called East-West between the British and Irish government on the British-Irish Intergovernmental Conference and between Northern Ireland, Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales and the Dominion um, areas of the UK. These institutions were there for a reason. They were to embed cooperation between the governments to place relations on the island within a wider context of east-west relations and to ensure that the agreement would be implemented fully with emphasis on reconciliation. So I would argue the long-term causes of the agreement have been neglected, the implementation of the institutions that are there has not occurred and that has had an impact on trust and it was Patrick who said to me um, now, I think three or four years ago, I'm trying to remember, maybe three, that cooperation was not as embedded as people thought. And now we see that, that it fell apart to an extent with Brexit. My final point, and I will round up quickly, is on equality, that perceptions of equality matter, obviously, not just objectively what we may think exists. And a very significant point um, made, I think, in, in a, by a number of speakers in different ways, that even if minority are deeply unhappy, that can cause violence. And the agreement has not been seen to deliver for a proportion of the unionist loyalist community in Northern Ireland who perceive that there is not equality or parity. That leads to a counter argument that they just don't like equality, that they're used to being a hegemon, that would be a Republican counter argument, but there is a problem about perception and the agreement I believe can be used robustly to rectify that and I hope it will. Thank you. Hey, thank you for all of these uh, excellent comments. Uh, Mr. Gilmore, I might uh, ask you if you wanted to respond uh, from 
the comments and add to what they've said and respond to that? Well, just maybe just taking maybe one thing in each of the um, commentaries. First of all, and Josephine is uh, describing the Colombian agreement as the most comprehensive uh, since the end of the Cold War, and it is. Uh, and a lot of the issues which beset Colombia these days, you know, issues related to uh, the drugs trade and the violence that's associated with that, uh, some of the more recent uh, social uh, unrest, you can find solutions for these issues within the agreement and complete implementation of the agreement is, um, is, is, is part of the answer. Um, I, I, agree, I, I agree fully with Patrick Griffin's point about pressing for understanding. They, they, that has to be the approach that we take moving forward in relation to, uh, to Northern Ireland. I'd be very interested to, to continue that discussion with him at, uh, at some point. Uh, Laurie's point, I, I agreed with the point he made that perhaps often in agreements, peace agreements, we don't give enough attention to the post agreement architecture. Uh, and for example, on Colombia, I think, for example, there needed to have been, if one looks back and it's easy, hindsight is great, but you look back and say, well, what could have been done better? One of the things the Colombia agreements could have been done better was perhaps a greater involvement of local and regional government in the construction of the, uh, the, the post agreement scenario. Uh, and then the final point um, on, on um, uh, Etim uh, points about uh, the, the zero sum, uh, the zero sum issue, and the I, I think I, I'm, I'm thinking back, for example, to the high point of the British Irish uh, relationship, which was probably um, at the time when uh, Queen Elizabeth visited President Higgins did a state visit to the UK. These weren't just visits. They also copper fastened. I remember, for example, in, during the uh, visit of Queen Elizabeth, launching together with the then Foreign Secretary William Hague, the first ever British Irish Chamber of Commerce. Just think about this. We've been trading biggest, our biggest trading partners, uh, Ireland's biggest trading partner. Uh, the UK's, I think, were the fifth biggest trading partner, about a billion euros worth of trade every day. There was no formal uh, chamber or structure uh, for doing First time ever was during, that, uh, during that visit. Uh, but she's probably right that uh, some of these areas probably didn't uh, didn't get the long term attention that they should have got. Well, there's been many uh, questions that come in, and also uh, lots of ideas have been raised here by uh, all of you, the speakers. Um, one question has come in about the role of religious communities and religious leaders at uh, national and local levels, uh, and uh, this. In some settings, we know uh, religious leaders have helped to play a role in facilitating dialogue among parties, uh, in some cases, helping to support institutions in Colombia, for example, uh, Father Duru and the, the Peace uh, Commission. Um, I wonder if any of you could talk about uh, the role of religious communities in the Irish context and in Colombia and uh, what role they played to date and perhaps what more needs to be done, especially now in both places as uh, challenges have emerged. Maybe Josefina, maybe you could start with that. And uh... Yes, uh, thank you, David. Well, at least the role of uh, the churches in Colombia has been quite influential in peace building. We work, uh, our, let's say our strategic partner, local partner in Colombia is the Caritas Colombia, Pastorate Social. Monsignor Hector Fabio now uh, is the leader of, um, of, of our project too, as partner in Colombia. This has been very important to us um, because this is the way in which we also are present in a lot of the territories, but we are also, it also allows us to have a little bit more of a better sense let's say what we have inherited in Colombia, this, this role of being engaged monitors, to be able to be present in a lot of situations, as Lori was saying, in which there is dialogue, there is facilitation, where we are uh, very much committed to a positive outcome, but we have to be able to remain open enough, creating a space enough so that different voices of um, that have a, the stakeholders in the, in the conflict have a space. Um, so for us, this alliance and this partnership with the Catholic Church has been very important, um, but precisely because it allows us to also occupy that space 
that has been so important for facilitation and dialogue, um, and especially in the post um, after after the agreement has been signed. Uh, with Lori, we've had the great opportunity to discuss this uh, before, but of course, it would be, yeah, in hindsight, we're all very intelligent and smart, but I think that um, seeing the phase of implementation of a peace agreement as a phase in which the, the, the need for dialogue and for conflict resolutions and for mechanisms for conflict resolution is also uh, highly relevant. I think if we were much more conscious of, of that need after the agreement has been signed, we would be able to have better safeguards to also be more ready ourselves to continue these dialogues and to continue this facilitation of conflict transformation after the agreement has been signed. So I do believe that the church gives us, or at least the Catholic church gives us that opportunity in Colombia. And we are absolutely um, thankful for, for that partnership. Otherwise we would be just uh, disengaged monitors. And that's, that's exactly the role we don't wanna play. Thank you. Other comments on this? Of course, in, in Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, the church has been, it, religious issues have been a fault line of the conflict, but Patrick. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to, to just address that briefly. I'd love to see what Attain had to say about this one. But I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. We see the virtues of doing a comparative kind of study like this because of how different they are. And one would think that, you know, religious groups have an important role to play. And indeed they have, and they've been playing an important role, critically important role when it comes to reconciliation. But that's a difficult and challenging question in the Irish context, as you put it, David, that, you know, um, that religion has historically been, of course, that kind of badge of identity, a marker of identity. And it really kind of lays out, if you will, one of the predominant fault lines you know, on the island of Ireland and in Northern Ireland in particular. It's also more difficult today because of kind of the dramatic changes that have gripped Ireland over the last generation. You have most, the most quickly secularizing society, arguably, in all of the world. And then how do you deal with the with the society in Ireland that is what you could almost regard as almost like a post-Christian kind of society now um, engaging with kind of uh, religious groups that could lead to kind of greater reconciliation. So I don't have any answers. I just kind of lay out that there are some more challenges. And so it's not as clear cut as it would be as Josefina was saying in some place like Colombia. Would I maybe just follow on from that, um, um, David? Um, during my political life, I'm probably associated with that process of secularization um, uh, in Ireland. And I want to say in respect to both uh, processes that the leaders, church leaders played an enormously important role in calling for peace in uh, condemning violence uh, and so on. And I, for example, Monsignor and now that uh, Josephina mentioned, I'm in regular contact even all the time with the Monsignor and now it does great work, uh, Father Giroux, um, the pap current papal nuncio uh, in, in, in Colombia uh, doing, doing great work. Um, church leaders in Ireland also played a hugely important part. But I think also, I think we shouldn't forget the role that the churches have played in providing a back channel. Uh, peace, peace talks don't start out of the blue. There has to be a lot of uh, informal discussions and in both Colombia and in Northern Ireland, um, it, it was people in the churches, you know, um, uh, we think, for example, of, um, of uh, Father Reed in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland, the role that, that he played in bringing people together. And these days, when we're looking at, when we're looking at conflicts elsewhere, uh, we can think of a number of them very often, uh, the first port of call, you know, who can, you know, who, who can get some kind of informal discussions going? Very often, uh, we're looking to the churches to, 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 to to build that bridge and it's, it's hugely important. Could I add in there as well? Um, but I think to agree about Father Alex Reed and Harold Good and a number of church leaders that came together, um, I think it was so vital. And also to say what Patrick said that now with secularization, I think the influence overtly is less. So the Irish Council of Churches, which is an ecumenical body of all the church leaders came together a few weeks ago to condemn the violence in Northern Ireland and to ask for CAM. But I'm not sure how much influence in itself that would now have. And in addition, the head of the Catholic Church for the island um, also asked that people be more generous in their celebration of the centenary of the Northern Ireland state, which occurred on Monday officially, 
for unionists, this was a something to celebrate. For nationalists and republicans, it obviously was something which is associated with discrimination and not to be celebrated. So that call was made in a very ecumenical way, but I'm not sure really very many listened to that. So the influence is far less now with secularization. But in terms of conflict resolution, the church has played all the churches, but Father Alex Reed does stand out, played a key role. Good. Um, another question arises around the issues of uh, peacemaking institutions that are part of the agreements in both cases, uh, mechanisms uh, for ways in which the parties can begin to work together. Uh, and as Josefina and Mr. Grimoire mentioned, uh, these have had challenges, but they're also crucial to uh, the ongoing peace process. But it appears in Colombia now, especially as Josefina mentioned, uh, these mechanisms are not really working. Partly is because they haven't been fully implemented yet. But in the context of both cases now, uh, dialogue is crucial. Uh, to what extent can these mechanisms that have been created uh, in the peace processes or others that need to be created, how can they uh, be activated now to address the tensions and difficulties both in Colombia uh, and in Ireland? Maybe uh, Laura, you could jump in at this point, uh, perhaps. Some... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on either Northern Ireland or Colombia, so I wouldn't want to be prescriptive. Um, you know, it, the, there is enormous opportunity for us to learn from each other's experiences. And Mr. Gilmore made that point in his initial remarks, um, where we learn from the experience positive and, and negative of other countries. And that's not to say that there's any particular model that we should follow but rather that we can learn from the experiences of other countries. The, the role of religious leaders, um, I'm, I'm struck by the experience of South Africa and South Sudan more recently, not only uh, what we've been saying about Colombia and Northern Ireland. And so that's a question that confronts both countries. Uh, you know, religious leaders across the faith spectrum, especially if they're working together in an interdenominational or interfaith way, they have a moral authority that often secular politicians or political parties don't have. They have an abiding commitment by virtue of their doctrines to justice, dignity, and peace. They have a, a legitimate role in peacemaking. So no one asks the question, why are faith communities involved in peacemaking, uh, mediation, conflict resolution? And faith communities also represent diverse communities. So they often represent communities across the political spectrum. Um, so I think that they can play a really vital peacemaking role. But what's required, you know, in the countries we're talking about is elsewhere is inspired leadership. So it's not going to be self-organizing. Um, in Nigeria before the 2015 presidential election, presidential election where there was a great risk of violence, religious leaders across the political spectrum, Christian and is Islamic, formed a national peace committee that was extraordinarily effective in preventing violence and managing conflict. And this came out of one or two individuals. Uh, this is an initiative supported by the EU, I should say, with a nod uh, to Mr. Gilmore. Um, this, is, this is an initiative that has continued over the last five years effectively, but it was initiated by one or two individual religious leaders who saw the need and had the courage to act. Other uh, comments from the panelists? I'll, I'll follow up on that and just piggyback on what, what Laurie had to say right there. And let me yoke together something he said earlier with something that Attain said, and that is kind of, he spoke about architecture. And when you think about our architecture, you think of structures, you think of institutions, and Attain used the word over and over again, trust. And I think what Laurie's pointing to is what we need more than anything else is kind of an architecture of trust that's created. It's the institutions themselves matter and the implementation matters. And this is, I think, what church leaders have done and what, what, what we need political leaders to do is that they have to be the architectures, the architects of trust. And that means I think what we need is greater intentionality. And it means people who are governing more or less kind of forgetting, if you will, some of what their uh, 
uh, the things that, that they're after, particularly a compromising on some of those and saying the most important good that we have right now and that we have to peddle in is going to be trust. And that's not, of course, that, that's easier said than done, but particularly at these moments when you find that say in a, a peace agreement is potentially wobbly, it's important that people step up and that they do that. And I think almost that intentionality and kind of the motivation, the principles upon which uh, institutions are based are almost just as important, if not more important than the, the institutions themselves. Hey, Tan, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think um, if I understood the question you posed, it was about the role of civil society and, and, and civic level cooperation. Um, and that has been a criticism um, from some of the implementation of the Good Friday Agreement as well, that that level has not materialized as much as was envisaged. But on the plus side, which I meant to say, um, and also defending um, the Special Representative's point about success, there is a, a group, a, a neither identity group, as, as most people here or some may know, in Northern Ireland, which has developed very strongly. They're usually younger voters um, and they are more sort of civic society orientated and they don't have a strong uh, preference about a united Ireland or staying in the union. And I think that level, at that level, that there's a great energy for more civil society involvement. And I hear it rhetorically and I can see different plans for it. Um, different groups have developed, some are, are more ideological, some not, but it would be associated very much with the Alliance Party in Northern Ireland as well, whose support base has increased significantly um, in, the, in the 2019 election, and they would claim and argue and aren't uh, allied to a very strong zero-sum approach to the constitutional issue. So that connects to civil society and to having civic forums in a positive way. The SDLP has also today launched its new civic forum to discuss the future of the island uh, with church leaders involved as well. Um, so at that level, I think there is some energy going into that now, but it has been seen as a weakness in the agreements implementation. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, Josefina, and in um, the Columbia Accord, as, as your reports have emphasized, there needs to be more implementation of the political participation provisions. Uh, and there is a mechanism, the national peace councils, and then there's supposed to be local peace councils established. Uh, could you say a, a bit more about those mechanisms? Are they being implemented well enough? Could they be uh, a mechanism for addressing the rising social tensions of, of the past week or so? Yes. Uh, thank you, David. I want to also weave this a little bit with what, what we were discussing before about thinking about implementation at the local and at the regional level, not only at the central level of government, especially in a country that is so uh, diverse and it has such uh, stark differences uh, between the, the cities and the rural areas it's, and, and the different geographies uh, of the country. And I think that what we have seen in the past year in 2020 is we had a lot of municipal elections. So at the level of the municipalities, but also at the level of, let's say, the states or the departments. And what we saw uh, at the Barometer Initiative in Colombia is that a lot of those new um, governors were, and the new mayors were looking at the peace agreement, were saying what has been already implemented so far and what needs to be implemented at the local level. So we're very happy about that. We need to be able to also strengthen those uh, local and regional plans to, be, to make sure that they have resources to implement them. They have until 2023 to do that. And we think that this is slowly what is happening in Colombia, that the decisions that have been made in the first couple of years um, in the city, in the capital, that relate very directly with the executive branch of power are moving much more to territories and where we're hoping to gain, and we had the great opportunity to speak with Eamon yesterday about this, what we're hoping to see is an ever increasing ownership uh, of citizens of the implementation of the peace agreement, especially at the local level. The peace and reconciliation councils have a very important uh, role to play there. There are over 500 of them in Colombia. Not all of them, unfortunately, are operating. 
And these councils are not only related to the direct implementation of the peace agreement, but they should be like the vessels for dialogue also about any sort of conflicts that require transformation, et cetera, at the local level. Um, so we can do much more to implement that. Another great mechanism that was already designed in the peace agreement, but that requires a more robust implementation um, in the international community, especially the US Department of State has also played a very important role in supporting those uh, territorial peace councils. And we're hoping that they are strengthened by the end of, of the year. But I want to mention one last thing about trust and the institutional architecture for peace agreement implementation, but also for reconciliation. And I think that it has a lot to do also with COVID. The idea that what we're seeing in the past year is not only from a socioeconomic perspective, is not only the uh, deepening of inequalities, and the, the, the real dire vulnerabilities of already vulnerable communities and peoples. Uh, in Colombia, a lot of people, if you don't work one day, you don't eat that day. So it's, I think that the, the idea of, of use, like of seeing the pandemic also that continues up until today, especially in Colombia, the, the health system has collapsed in the last few weeks again. What we're seeing is also that COVID, the restrictions of mobility, the sanitary restrictions has had a very difficult effect on participation because people cannot meet in person. And this has is, is a challenge for all peace builders around the world and peace researchers is if those informal conversations that we were talking about before, impartial peace agreements before comprehensive peace agreements, if the spaces for informal gatherings are not, are not possible. Isn't that also one of those reasons and factors that can create conflicts to escalate? Because there are no moments of dialogue, there are no gatherings that allow people to have face-to-face -face conversations. So we need, the pandemic is here for a very long time. We are seeing more waves. We need to think of alternative paths for gatherings, for informal conversations, in a way that we are able to continue dialogues in the midst of this of these very difficult conditions for our health. A number of questions have come in about the role of social media, um, both constructive and uh, harmful, uh, and to some extent, we're, we're right here in a, a Zoom uh, a webinar meeting via social media, it can be a constructive tool for understanding and exchange of information, but there's also uh, much spreading of fake news and uh, of hate uh, messaging. Uh, could any, uh, either you or any of the panelists comment on the role of the social media in uh, this post uh, peace accord process and where we're in the implementation phase in, in both cases, and especially with these recent crises? Uh, Yeah, I can say something yeah, um, very briefly. I, I think it's been a very negative force. I think with the polarization of Brexit that's impacted on Northern Ireland and Ireland um, and the rise of um, support among particularly young people for United Ireland in Ireland, although as um, Eamon Gilmore said, support um, is not strong if, if you know, there's a, a fear of a risk of, of instability and violence. But I think we see a polarization in social media that I see myself that is very new to me that I didn't grow up with, um, where something which can be a middle of the road view can quickly be called, uh, anecdotally, I was called a partitionist um, on Twitter because I supported the idea of the shared island unit, which has been set up by the Irish government to promote dialogue and to have a gradualist approach to the unification issue. These are terms I've never been brought up with. I mean, we, we were all very much gradualists in my environment. So I think social media exaggerates the zealots and gives them perhaps a sense our perception to society that they're more dominant than they are or that they form a majority when often perhaps they don't but that sort of language on either side of the divide unionist and nationalist 
uh, loyalist and Republican, I think it has become accentuated by social media, and I would say it's quite negative. I, I, if, if I could maybe follow that, Jane, I, I agree largely with what you're what you're saying, but I think it's also been compounded now by the COVID crisis, because not only do we have a situation where uh, people's communication and their you know, what they're reading, what they're discussing, is in this in their, is in their own social media bubble. But in addition to that, we now have people being in physical, very small physical bu bubbles. So the amount of engagement I think that is taking place is probably lower than it has been for a very long time. And as I said in my opening remarks, I mean the essence of politics is to uh, is to engage with people with whom you don't agree and to have the debate. And that debate is is diminished. Um, hopefully, ways will be found that uh, social media can be used constructively and positively uh, to promote that debate uh, over over time. Yeah, what are those ways? Yeah, Patrick, please. Yeah, I'll just add something on that too. It's in, in, in the midst of COVID, especially what we're dying for, I think is community. And, and it's the sort of conversations you can only have in community, but I think social media fosters, if you will, the wrong kind of community because it's people who would normally be isolated or finding one another. And we want isolated people, good, uh, people of goodwill who are isolated to find one another and try to kind of struggle together through all of this. But to a certain extent, you find isolated voices can latch on to one another when it comes to social media. And ultimately, social media doesn't allow you two things that are absolutely critical to all the things that we're talking about. We talked about the word trust so much. It just doesn't lend itself to creating trust across the spectrum because it generally kind of tends toward, as, as Tain was saying, it tends toward people on the margins. And the other thing, it doesn't lend itself to perspective. And so it's just as because of its immediacy, you're not having an opportunity to actually be reflective about these sorts of things. So reflection and trust are critical and social media doesn't help that even though it may kind of foster a sense of community in the midst of COVID. Yeah, a question has come in, it's a big issue in terms of the role of memory and memorialization. Uh, and Patrick, you talked about you know, the ambiguity uh, to focus on the present and the challenges in the future, rather than being bound by the history. And yet in the peace processes, it's felt important to have a truth process and to allow the victims a chance uh, to have voice and to be heard. Uh, so how do we balance these impulses, uh, one to overcome <laughs> the violence and the, the hatred of the past, but at the same time, uh, keep a record and a memory of what occurred uh, and to give voice to the victims. Okay, if you like, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, and, and this is a comment from the South African experience where we've been uh, in a, a democratic state or post-conflict state for longer than either Northern Ireland um, or, or Colombia. What's been disappointing and depressing about the South African experience with respect to trust, an issue that Patrick emphasized earlier is that with the passing of time, trust and reconciliation and healing have reduced, not strengthened. So we have a lower level of trust and a lower level of reconciliation today than we had in the uh, transition to democracy and then in the immediate wake of democracy. And that is largely because reconciliation is not sustainable in the absence of redress and transformation. And in South Africa, at least, those issues are far more important for the majority of people than memorialization and truth, which is not to say that truth and memorialization are unimportant. But for the, the vast majority of people, the, the challenge of equality, of dignity, of the undoing of the structural injustices of apartheid, which have not been adequately met at all, are the most burning, pressing issues. I collaborated on a book project with a colleague, focus was on the South African constitution, which is a beautiful, a beautiful document, beautiful institution. My colleague's chapter was headed, you can't eat the Bill of Rights. And the point of his chapter was, so we have these beautiful institutions and rights, et cetera, in the constitution filled with aspiration and promise. But if people's daily lives have not changed sufficiently, then we remain in peril. 
other comments on this? Mm -hmm. Oh, you, uh, you, boy, oh boy, what a difficult and challenging question. And in Ireland, particularly, people find themselves in the midst of almost kind of never ending anniversaries, really beginning with 1912 onto today. And so these issues keep coming up again and again and again. One's reminded of Winston Churchill's comment about Ireland after the First World War, where after the, the carnage of the First World War, he sees the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone rising once again. And that's what happens every time that you're dealing with one of these anniversaries. I get it back to something that Laurie said earlier on with this. I think it's absolutely critical. Leadership is so profoundly important at these particular moments. You have on the one hand to honor people in the way that they situate themselves in the past. So even though we say we want to avoid the past to a certain extent and avoid the past when it comes to people thinking about their presence and their futures, you have to honor the fact that people do indeed situate themselves in time and situate themselves by these events. That's critically important, but at the same time, leaders have to step up and say, look, we have a diversity of different views. We have lots of different people who will situate themselves by different events and different anniversaries. And we have to recognize that in order to honor the dignity of each person, we have to kind of honor their ability to celebrate what they will as they will. But this is always putting leaders on, on difficult terrain, but that's where it really becomes, comes back to kind of in, like we talked about before, trust and intentionality. And so you need leaders that are really going to kind of put their heads above the parapet and be willing to say these often difficult sorts of things to help people kind of manage these very challenging times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just looking at the uh, comparison between the Colombian peace process and the Northern Ireland peace process, I think the Colombian process was actually better on this issue, better on the issue of victims and of matters dealing with the past. First of all, because victims were enabled to participate in the negotiation of the agreement. And you had civil society and you had a broader range of people who were actually involved in the negotiation. In Northern Ireland, it was essentially a negotiation involving political parties and the two uh, governments. And the issue of the past in a way was, was postponed. We'll, we'll deal with that later. Let's get the conflict resolved and we'll deal with the past later. And the problem in Northern Ireland is that, you know, everybody has their own victims uh, and uh, their own uh, issues to commemorate and to some extent I think that's also been exaggerated somewhat by the you know the, the memorialization of of what happened 100 years ago the the independence and foundation of Northern Ireland and, and so on and I think the, the the key to this is you know the past is important and it's important to remember and to learn from the past but it's also important to look forward and uh, one of the things uh, memories I have from Colombia is a meeting I had in, I think it was in Putumayo, with a group of women um, who had lost husbands, partners, and so on. And they were talking about compensation, what they were expecting. And they weren't talking about big sums of money or anything like this. One woman said to me, she said, all I want is for school books, copy books, pencils, school equipment for my children. I want the opportunity for my children to have a better, better, better future. So I think that that's where, you know, again, we have to, to you know, refocus this onto the, you know, on, onto the, um, onto the future, but building, building a better, better future rather than constantly um, being preoccupied with the past. Thank you. Well, as we finish up, let me uh, ask any of the panelists maybe to go around one last time. And we have these important actors who provide external support, the United States, uh, European Union, we as academics in terms of the research and uh, evaluation and monitoring that we provide. Uh, maybe if you uh, could, each of the panelists, one final comment. What's the most important thing that either our governments or we as uh, academic scholars should be doing now to uh, advance the process and address the, uh, the current uh, challenges? So maybe uh, start with you, Etan. Oh. <laughs> um. Well, I, I suppose from a, a US government perspective, I think the, um, the role of President Biden in facilitating agreement and building trust between the governments is vital. And he has shown that um, intention and he's very diplomatic and a multilateralist. So that does not mean that he antagonizes the British government where there are rifts, um, but that he plays that sort of mediating, facilitating role, which the US played. Um, and 
that role was always, I think, not, not necessarily causal. It was also working with both governments. So I think that is vital um, to be facilitating. And for the European Union, as Tishak said, and uh, to also be facilitating of agreement and compromise um, during this tense Brexit period. Well, Laurie? I think the most important um, imperative for all ex external actors, whether they are donors or multilateral organizations or partner organizations, the imperative is to avoid being arrogant. The imperative is to avoid imposing our priorities, our values, our deadlines on societies that are in crisis or emerging from crisis. So the challenge is to respect local actors, to respect their priorities and values. That doesn't mean we support all local actors and all local values, so we're going to be selective. It means that we have to work with, with humility and in partnership with local actors that include civil society, but also the state at national, provincial, and local levels. So really, I, I think bottom line is external actors need to be humble and respectful of local actors. Patrick. I would agree completely. And uh, I anxiously await the, you know, the naming of a special envoy from the United States government to Northern Ireland. I think that's going to be fascinating to see who it's going to be and also fascinating to hear what the priorities will be. So far, the Biden administration, I think, has kind of hit on exactly the notes that, that Laurie's talking about with ex one exception, and that is the stroke agreement, you know, if we'll call it that anyway, his holy writ. And this is something that, you know, that, that the administration has got completely behind saying, no matter what happens, we have to stand behind the agreement and then we'll work from there. That to me is very encouraging news as we think about what the future is going to be. And the United States, as, as Atain was saying, has historically played kind of a facilitating role and sometimes even a catalytic role when it comes to these two, uh, uh, the two different parties in Northern Ireland, the two different groups, but also the British and the Irish government. So it'll be exciting to see when that special envoy is named. Yes, thank you. I, I'm not sure that I have a, a only one key, but I do know that in our role as both internal and external, as both being part of the conflict system and trying to, you know, provide positive impulses, being propositive about how to move forward, especially in the implementation of the peace agreement in Colombia. I know that what we are preaching all the time, this idea that we are all part of a community, that the differences among us are hallucinations and that we are all you know, that we all belong to the same spiritual community and humanity. This starts from us. It starts from the monitors also expanding that space and seeing all these different stakeholders dealing with their conflicts, as Lori was saying, taking a step back and saying, we're here to support you. We're here to provide spaces. We're here for the long run. Um, at PAM, we look at the implementation after 10, ten years after this, the signatories have, have signed the agreement. What we see here today with the, with the 1998 agreement, without a name, uh, is that 10 years might not be enough. That we're looking at least at a couple of uh, decades, if not at least one generation, and that we all have to have the commitment to be there. And that requires, of course, financial help and that requires also that those who have more resources, more time, um, different skills that we're also available for those who are embedded in conflict situations to find spaces for facilitation, reconciliation, et cetera. So we're here, we're here for you, we're here to stay. Mr. Gilmore, thanks again for joining us for your leadership in both of these peace processes and uh, final remarks, please. Well, I think what we have learned over the last year and a bit from the COVID crisis is that the world is a small place, that uh, when we get something like COVID, it doesn't matter whether you are in Africa, in Latin America, uh, in Northern Ireland or any part of the world, you suffer it exactly the same way. And the cure for it is the same, uh, the world, and we have to do it together. It's taught us the world has to work together. And that's why I think the multilateral way uh, dealing with peace, climate, uh, pandemics, or whatever. I think we have to strengthen that. And the most encouraging thing that has happened uh, that I can see over the last year 
with the re-engagement by the United States in the multilateral system. And uh, the European Union certainly is working very closely uh, with the US administration to see what we can do together, but not just with the US administration, with the UN system of regional organizations like the, the African Union and ASEAN and um, uh, around the world. We have to work together. And that means governments, international organizations, civil society, uh, uh, think tanks, universities, the academic world, these are common problems we all face and uh, we'll overcome them if, if we can work together. Scott, closing word for us? No, only that it's been a fascinating conversation. I thank all of you, all the panelists, and of course, Eamon Gilmore, our friend, uh, for being with us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So long. Thank you, David. Bye-bye.